and welcome to this episode of Mind the Gap, making education work across the globe with me, Tom Sherrington and Emma Turner. Hello, Emma. How are you? I'm very excited, Tom. How are you? I'm very excited for our guest. Oh, I know. It's brilliant. Drum roll. <laughs> <laughs> We're really excited that, that this episode is with the one and only Sarah Cottingham, who is over-practiced on Twitter and a, a, a fantastic communicator about education. So welcome to Mind the Gap, Sarah. Hello, thanks for having me. I hope that wasn't an anticlimax for your, for your listeners. <laughs> <laughs> After the drum roll. You, you, you've, you've got a bit of a, you're a, bit of a legend, uh, you know, um, and, you know, there, there's something that you've created this kind of uh, space around you where it's funny because you sometimes think like everything's been said that could be said about teaching and Twitter's Twitter, but then all of a sudden you've carved this like beautiful space around communicating uh, research, cognitive science for teachers. And it's, it's amazing. So it's great to have this sort of, kind of fresh wave of clarity of thinking in, in our space. So I, I massively appreciate it. So we're really delighted to have you here. Brilliant. Yeah, it's communication is so important, isn't it? Uh, your previous guest, I was listening to your episode with Efrat first, who's, an, who's just fantastic at communicating this stuff as well. So yeah, that was really interesting. Yeah, so you, you two are sort of in as a mining the same sort of territory in some way. So just for people who who don't know your background and just just tell us a little about kind of the work you're doing and you know how this type of stuff comes into that work. Yeah, sure. Um, so I got quite fascinated, as a lot of people did, with cognitive science um, from reading Daniel Willingham's book "Why Don't Students Like School" um, and his simple model model of memory. Uh, and I had never thought, I don't think I made the connection between learning and memory, really. I know in, 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 that sounds ridiculous, but when I was teaching, I kind of, it was very trial and error. Um, I think a lot of people say this, don't they? They were kind of um, just trying things out and seeing what stuck. Um, and then cognitive science sort of came into my life and it was just very fascinating. So I started kind of training teachers and that's when I learned about uh, cognitive science and then I got really fascinated with it and did a master's in educational neuroscience um, just to find out like what's happening in the brain when we learn and can we use anything from neuroscience that will really help us to understand learning perhaps in a deeper way even than psychology uh, so I studied neuroscience um, and then I started blogging and that's really like clarified my thinking on some of these points. So currently you're working for Ambition. Is, so what, what's that, what does that role involve? So I work, um, I oversee the specialist NPQs um, that Ambition deliver and we're the biggest provider of the NPQs and the specialist ones are the ones for um, people doing the leading teaching, leading teacher development, which is particularly close to my heart and the leading behaviour and culture and leading literacy. So I oversee those and we think really hard about learning. Um, and obviously it's, it's a bit different because a lot of it's online. So it's how do we ensure that we're getting these, like, you know, the encoding, the consolidating, the retrieval, how are we ensuring that's happening when it's all kind of, well, mainly delivered um, online. So that's, that's my focus at the moment. So MPQs meaning national professional qualifications <laughs> like this yeah. jar English jargony things <laughs> uh, so, and you yeah. just mentioned encoding so uh, Ephra had this great sort of meta phrase where she talked about how she's teaching students about encoding and having to encode get them encoding the idea of encoding I thought that like, this is I could geek out on this stuff all day long. <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, and Emma's Emma's kind of like idea of the mirrors and the mirrors and it's yeah. a mirror and a mirror and a mirror and a yeah I like that. So, uh, Emma, what's what's we always we have this sort of different perspectives on our guests. So, what how's Sarah come into your world? Sarah's come into my world because um, she wrote a, a blog where I was kind of half dancing around the room, going yes, yes, I'm so glad somebody somebody said this. Um, it was the one about the the factors affecting um, how effective cognitive science is in the classroom. Um, and I just found it completely fascinating. Fell into the blog and then lost about two days uh, in, inside the blog. But yeah, it was it was a 
the bit about um uh not about it not being a silver bullet but it being part of that jigsaw your jigsaw blog was the way that I found my way into your work basically Sam so I I don't know whether now's the right time to explain the jigsaw Tom but I do want to talk about the jigsaw at some point <laughs> Let's talk about the jigsaw. So, what, what, for people who, you know, obviously we can visualize a jigsaw. So, what, what's the basic idea in that, in that, Sarah? So, I have to uh, credit Tom, uh, Dr. Tom Perry, with this, who, whose idea the jigsaw was. And I, I just sort of picked it up from him and asked if I could work on a blog with him um, about it because I, this idea I think is really important. So, um, essentially, sometimes, we we treat often we treat kind of like these new things that we we find out about like retrieval practice or whatever the kind of thing is as a kind of silver bullet don't we as something that's going to kind of solve learning um in our schools and um and then the research kind of moves into the domain of the classroom um and they you know the teachers are actually doing this stuff and they're trying to kind of measure it and see what happens and all these lab studies that they did that seem to come out with like lovely clean results that show that retrieval works every time. And you bring it into the messy environment of the classroom, that kind of like wicked domain. And, and suddenly like the results are all over the shop. And we've got like a nice example of that in um, Churches et al did a um, kind of study with teachers who were actually delivering this stuff in the classroom. And it, they were doing these randomized control trials. And like sometimes retrieval practice was helpful. And sometimes, you know, it, it wasn't that helpful. And they make the point that all of these things, all of these strategies that we, you know, think of these silver bullets, they're things that can enhance really good teaching anyway as a basis. And that's what Tom Perry's kind of point was. It's like, it's part of the jigsaw. Like it's it's part of really good teaching as a much wider domain. And it's not this silver bullet. And just that kind of conceptualization of it, I think, is, is really helpful. Um, and I also think, because so sometimes it can be a bit disappointing when you find out the silver bullet is not the silver bullet. Um, but I actually think it's really empowering because it's like it's not this thing you just didn't realize for 20 years of your career and you should feel guilty about. It's not like that. No, you, you know, you, you, you teach if you teach well, this can also help. And the way you do it and the way you contextualize it and that relies on your knowledge and your professional judgment is um, is going to make it work well or not so well. And that's the kind of interesting interplay of like these these approaches with the classroom context, I guess. Because the bit that was making me really dance as well with all of that was the fact when you were saying it depends on the age group of the children, it depends on the subject. And I was thinking, oh, I'm so glad somebody is saying this because it just, it seems so obvious to say that, but it's not, like you say, it gets lost in translation. You end up with these whole school approaches to, oh, we've learned about retrieval practice, so we've learned about space, and so we're going to do everything in exactly the same way, regardless of how old the children are, or regardless of what subject we're doing. It becomes a nonsense, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. And Tom, you write about this in, in your blogs, and you know, Christine Council's talked about this. You know, it's We have to respect like the integrity of the subject that we're teaching, and if what we're doing is we're kind of slotting the subject into this weird five random questions at the beginning of a lesson and it's it's kind of not respecting the way that the subject is should be sequenced and understood then it's it's kind of what we're doing we're not we're not aiming for the end goal which is building these vast rich connected bodies of knowledge anymore we're just taking tiny facts usually and just like hoping our students will sort of retain individual facts and that's not moving them towards the end goal that we want it's so interesting how it has to be uh, so subject specific so because i think sometimes there's a i think there's a subtle thing here because sometimes people hear this sort of thing about critiquing retrieval practice say and they'll go yeah see all that all that cog size stuff's rubbish and then literally they'll sort of diss the whole thing whereas we, it's a much more you know, subtle messages. It's about saying, now what we're sort of saying is a uh, robotic kind of quizzing, like da 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 da. But even that can be helpful in some situations. But it's about the the type of retrieval practice rather than 
is retrieval practice thing? Because to me, it's it's the problem is it's it's an umbrella term for multiple types of generative activity or retrieval, and it it might be something where you have to sort of string a whole sentence together. But I'll, un, underneath it, you've got this sort of schema idea. So you're big on schema building. I was talking to some history teachers earlier today, uh, uh, people who are big, going to be writing one of the inaction books for history. And there's this weird idea that two different sets of teachers, two schools could teach totally different um, periods of history, the different facts, but through the totally different sets of facts, they're creating the same kind of conceptual framework for history because the this conceptual framework is what you're trying to actually teach like passage of time the general idea but anyone but the specific individual facts are kind of a means to that end and that, to me that's just really mind-blowing isn't it that the actual facts themselves are much less important than the thing they contribute to I, that's so interesting isn't it it's really interesting and then when you think about how the brain works it just makes total sense. This is why I love neuroscience because schema obviously is construct. There's no such thing as a like, well, if you look in the brain, you can't see a particular schema, but it's a really helpful metaphor, isn't it? For us to talk about knowledge and how it's structured. And if you think about the brain and what the brain is doing, people think their memories are kind of like to help them to reminisce, but that's not what memories are for. Memories are to help you to predict what's going to happen in the future as accurately as possible, because that's how we survive. Um, you know, less so nowadays in terms of, you know, we've not got all the same threats that our ancestors maybe had, but that's what it's for. It's for prediction. So our schemas represent kind of our like best attempt at capturing knowledge that's going to help us make good predictions in different situations. So it's really precious. The schema is really precious. It's been built up over time. And um, it's essentially like all your experiences, your brain's kind of sucked out the commonalities so that you can say, go into a restaurant and understand how to operate in that restaurant or, you know, um, avoid the dark alley because you can make a prediction that it might be more dangerous, that kind of thing. So you've got these schemas, precious knowledge. And then um, they, uh, they're not just going to kind of um, let any old knowledge kind of in to update them. They only want to update in relation to things that are kind of relevant to them. So when we're thinking about learning and stuff, we're thinking about how um, our, we think about kind of connecting to those schemas and how if we don't connect to those schemas, if we don't sort of um, make information relate to those schemas, then those schemas are not going to just let in any, any old knowledge and just ruin themselves. They're only going to let things in if it chimes with the schema and it kind of enables it to update. So, yeah, I totally agree. Schemas are absolutely fascinating and just... <laughs> Just, I just think it's brilliant. Don't you think, fun, I, I, I've actually met these people and engaged with them on Twitter, where you just think, like in, in the classic Dan Willing book, like I can put it off the shelf here, there's, there's a chapter in here, you already mentioned it, and the classic diagram. So when, on Oliver and I did our book, you know, we turned it into a sort of look in a head. It's essentially the same diagram, but it looks like a head. But he just has like three boxes. And he, I've literally seen people who are quite well-known people, right? It's not like the working memory is just a box inside your brain. <laughs> Nobody thinks that. It's a schematic diagram of, of a process and it's a representation, it's a metaphor. It's called the sim are... simple model of memory, isn't it? Because it is a simplified, really helpful version <laughs> of memory, but it's not, you know, it's supposed to be indicative of exactly how memory works. It's not like a place in your somebody... brain. I love the idea of somebody thinking you can flip your head open and there's a box, there's a working memory box, and there's another box. <laughs> well, my box is a bit full. I've got to sort of, yeah, it's, it's odd, isn't it? But this, I, I found that just the schematic thing of, you know, working memory and then, you know, schema being in, in there. It, and, and, and I think, I, well, I, one of the things I like doing in my training is sort of showing people they have schemas for stuff. So you could say something like New York. I, it's like, I love this sort of mental tourism. Let's go to New York and what do you know about it? Can you imagine it? What does it look like? Have you ever been there? And film set there and the Empire State Building. And you go, oh my God, I have this schema of ideas all connected. And I bring it into my working memory right now. And five seconds ago, I wasn't thinking about it at all. And now it's it's all there. And it's just that you can go somewhere else or think about a, a book or a, 
it's it's amazing. It's sort of it's it's fascinating, isn't it? That. But the thing yeah. is that we can't see each other's schemas, so we have to communicate so that we can. So I want to get on. You get you on to talk about Alcibel, okay? So breaking news, folks. Sarah Cottingham is writing an inaction book to join the, the mighty series uh, of inaction books about you know what people's research in action. And you're doing yours about Alcibel's theory of sort of meaning making, aren't you? So come on, give us give us a kind of easy access version of what his his basic messages um so i think i think most people know Ajibel for his famous quote um about like the most important kind of variable in in what you learn is kind of what you already know so your most important thing is is your kind of prior knowledge or existing knowledge about something and i think that's kind of all i knew when uh when uh we were in touch tom and i was like i'm gonna write this book about Ajibel, and that was that was all i knew about him um and then I started reading his theory, which is called assimilation theory, um, and he talks about meaningful learning. And it's really changed the way I think about learning. It's been absolutely transformational for me, and I hope that it will be for other people as well, because I don't think his work's kind of quite got the recognition that it probably deserves. And um, so I'll tell you the reason why I think it's it's been transformational. So when you when like me you kind of you look at cognitive science you look at neuroscience um you learn an awful lot about memory and about how we learn um and when i was studying neuroscience in particular you're focusing like the experiments that you look at you're focusing on like retaining bits of knowledge because that's all you can kind of test in neuroscience you can't you don't look at things over long periods you know because you're doing it in an fMRI scanner or, a, you know, all those little electrodes on your head with the EEG. So you can't really look at things over time. You can't really look at students building up like the sort of knowledge we want in schools. As your Bell's theory is completely focused on the end goal that teachers want. And that is to build these rich bodies of knowledge in the subjects that they're teaching. So you mentioned the history teachers just now, Tom. They're aiming for these rich complex schema built around concepts about different historical periods that, that that students can link together to compare and contrast understand themes over time like what we're asking students to remember is massive you know even though they're only going to remember like the gists of it they're still expected to really understand different time periods and how things connect together and that's, that's one subject we teach students what how many subjects they learn they learn so many subjects and we want bodies of rich stable knowledge in all of those subjects and as Yubel says that the only way that we can achieve this is through meaningful learning and then he goes on to explain meaningful learning and his theory also incorporates forgetting as well which is really quite comprehensive so that's a kind of that's why it's sort of been transformational for me when you say meaningful learning, in the context of his work, what does he what does he mean by meaningful learning? Yeah, great question. So um, if you think about learning on a continuum where you've got like rote learning and then on the other end, meaningful learning. Now, nothing is really ever rote, purely rote learned because you're always trying to connect things. So even if you're listening to someone who you don't really understand that well, maybe they're talking about a theory you've never heard of. You're always trying to connect what they're saying to what you know. Even if you come up blank a lot of the time, you're still trying quite hard to link to something. Um, and if you aren't really able to make very many links, the only way that you're going to kind of learn that thing is by kind of repeating it to yourself over and over again. So you think about someone sort of reeling off their phone number to you, Emma. The only way you're really going to remember it is if you keep mentally rehearsing it over and over again. Um, otherwise, it's just going to disappear because it's not really connecting to much that you know. You'll probably, in a you know, the next day, only remember that it started with 07 because you know that <laughs> all start with 07. But the rest of it will be gone. So that's kind of rote learning when we when we don't really have much to connect it with or we don't recognise that we have much to connect it with. And it sort of sits as like little islands of knowledge in our heads and then it's easily forgotten. 
And then as we move along the continuum, that's when we're learning things that we're making more connections to what we already know. And sort of kind of rich, meaningful learning is when we when we learn something that we connect to what we already know and we can sort of we're building on stuff we already have in our minds and we're reconciling it with things that seem contradictory or, you know, seem to be related and but are confusing. And we managed to kind of reconcile this piece of knowledge, understand where it sits in our schema and really kind of slot it into what we already know and that's like meaningful learning you know while you're talking I'm in my head I've got a picture of like a little cog spinning on its own and then it moves along and clicks at the and then they're both moving together and then the the next one and the next one and the next one until it's like that game where all the cogs are moving together at the same time I'm gonna have to borrow that for the book (laughs) (laughs) there you go credit Turner there you go when you think it just it sits there on its own it doesn't connect to anything I was thinking about it like spinning it's got those little teeth with the potential to connect but it's not and it needs to connect to something else to move that thinking along to then go along again yeah, that's really nice <laughs> that's yeah. very good it's, it's because um Emma Emma's a visual learner that's uh, sorry that's, a, that's oh, don't a, go down that road <laughs> that's a, that's a, uh, wash <laughs> your mouth out <laughs> <laughs> no it's it, obviously you know is it it's a, a, an absolutely hilarious edgy joke um so in in, the, in your blog you write this thing that's a great it's just, this is where the jigsaws all come together so in one of your blog posts which is schemas determine what we learn you 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 quote as well you say nothing we teach is inherently meaningful which is a pretty punchy statement in itself um meaning is made in the interaction between the material we teach and the knowledge pupils already have and that to me and then you've got these two jigsaw pieces um material being taught prior knowledge and it's the meaning is in that in, and i think that is just absolutely choice a cl- classic bit of so well explained the meaning comes from connecting the, the stuff so now that doesn't that this is so interesting and this is this thing so we know we interviewed uh, dylan william recently and it links to what he was saying about teachers who are, who are really effective are actually not necessarily showing the scores in tests like now but their their impact can be found later like after the point of them teaching for sort of a number of years their impact can be the resonance that goes because their that meaning making must be being facilitated there in a way which less effective teachers don't seem to do they can get the quick snappy factual recall but do you think why, why do you think it's such a it seems so obvious when you see it spelled out that way but it's not how teachers think when they're presenting information is it sort of what do you know how does this connect that interaction with the students is it because it's difficult to do or it's because we're not thinking about doing it enough do you think um no that's good it's a great question um i think that we i think this is my my feelings on it i think we think i think we think the way that we think is the way that everybody else thinks that's, that's, what, that's what I think. It's a lot of things in there, but I I think we assume that when we say something, especially like I'm thinking about myself as a teacher, I used to think I was coming up with great explanations for things, and I used to think I was I used to think I was um, teaching texts that were like so interesting to my students, just inherently interesting because I found them interesting. But what Ashibel teaches you, which is just a penny drop moment, is like nothing is inherently interesting nothing is inherently meaningful because meaning is when you connect to existing knowledge and everyone's existing knowledge is different even you know ever so slightly different but mostly very different so whereas I think that um, A Christmas Carol is an absolutely amazing novella and everyone should read it because it's brilliant and kids I I think kids are going to love it it's about Christmas for God's sake you know they're actually going to love it it's brilliant got ghosts in it you know going through periods of time like what more could you want when you actually teach a Christmas carol to students if students don't really know that much about Christmas or you know maybe don't celebrate Christmas if you know they start reading it and they realize the text is actually very difficult to read 
and therefore quite difficult to teach, especially as we tend to do it with like year seven, um, which is really hard, then it's not this meaningful, interesting text because it's not interacting with their existing knowledge in the way that it interacts with my existing knowledge. And I just think that's a really powerful concept that like meaning is made in the minds of your students, mm. not in your mind and not in your words. Your words can facilitate meaning in their minds but they can't create meaning. And that was like a really big sort of penny drop moment for me from Azubel. So yeah, in, in short, I think we assume that, we assume we assume a few things. We assume that they will understand what we say in the way that we've said it, when no one ever understands what you say in the way you said it, because they connect it with their own existing knowledge. And I think there's also something you said to me, Tom, a little while ago, which was like, we assume that students are mentally rehearsing things that we're saying, and mm. like they probably aren't <laughs> they're probably mind wandering or they're probably like you know not yeah. actually rehearsing it i i think that i think uh, it sounds negative but I, I think sort of assuming things like that are, are so helpful so assume people will have forgotten stuff assume half the class didn't understand it assume probably people didn't really hear you the first time <laughs> um and assume some of you have drifted off in the last two minutes because it's it's just a better bet assuming that they haven't yeah you know, one, one of my sort of pet peeves and i don't i don't mean too critical because people you know do have different ways of doing things but is when people sort of over valorize if that's a phrase to use uh the kind of the the messy kind of organic chat in the class you know i here is me the university tutor really kind of like vibing on this great theme with my class and really getting into the stuff with the sort of seven, eight, 12 students participating. So it feels quite a few. Oh, so many ideas, guys. And you're sitting there next to James, who's going, what the hell are they talking about? <laughs> and can't say anything because he's like rabbit in the headlights. And the teacher sort of, it's all in the, it's all ephemeral. And it, that is, that is a problem, isn't it? That type of teaching is not, paying attention to that issue that is everybody here are we all making sense and you can get a bit carried away with it yeah it's quite a romantic notion isn't it of yeah um, of, of teaching in a way that I, I never experienced <laughs> as a teacher personally but, um... <laughs> oh surely <laughs> no, no if I if I, I was uh I was teaching at a school where if you kind of got them to sit down for an hour you've done you've done very well at that point which is a shame but um yeah never quite experienced that but it, it does it, it feels it feels I think there's this idea this metaphor of teach of learning as, as being very natural and I think what's been really powerful that's come out of Willingham's work and other people's work on in cognitive science is that like some some things are biologically primary some things we pick up very easily they're almost like part of our development if you think about the development and learning, they're almost like part of our natural sort of development and they're easy for us to learn. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff that's really flipping hard to learn. You know, it's why like, you know, Daniel Williams just written his book, Outsmart Your Brain, because your brain isn't designed to learn this stuff. And so it isn't this like natural osmosis that, you know, they're just taking it in and it's all kind of getting in there somehow. And I think if we can abandon this natural metaphor a little bit and see it the way that Willingham talks about it, like the residue of thought, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. We have to like outsmart our brains. Then we can move away from this romantic notion and we can move towards a kind of a more sort of, OK, maybe it's a bit less, bit less cool to think about it in this way, but it will probably benefit more students, as you were kind of alluding to there, Tom. I just love the fact that you're vibing less and I can't get past that. <laughs> it's funny. I just wanted to ask Sarah, is, is there an issue then as well is with what we know about how we learn and how we make connection, that we need the space to make connection and we need the opportunity to deliberately point out that connection and to narrate that or narrate our expert schema and say, this is the connection I am thinking, this, you know, I'm deliberately pointing it out. And then the amount of content that we have to get through in the curriculum which is why it then becomes the disparate fact show rather than the actually time to narrate that connection 
Do you think there's a kind of an awkward bedfellow situation between what we know about how we learn and actually how much we're expecting children to learn? Yeah, I feel like this is the biggest kind of pushback on it is like, you know, I don't I don't kind of have time for them to do this. We need to get through the content. Mm-hmm. And I suppose like, like, you know, having experienced that myself, I do definitely really sort of empathise with it. I think that the, 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 the thing to kind of keep our minds on is that meaningful learning is learning for the long term. And that's what we want. So if we don't have time for it, we're saying we don't have time for long term learning. And that's the job that we've got to do. Yeah. So it's it's kind of there's that there is that inherent contradiction, but we have to make time for certain things. So what I mean by that, and it's completely changed the way I deliver my professional development, this as you bells stuff as well. So now I build in significant periods of time to the detriment of some content. Um I build in time for like um self-explanation and um, basically things that are going to help them to make connections so often asking questions like what does this mean for you in a concrete way in your teaching so give me some concrete ways that this would work in you so they're connecting to what they already know constantly throughout the session otherwise everything just kind of gets lost and I think that's where like really good curriculum sequencing can really help you. So Tom, again, talking about those, the, the history teachers, then they're, they're teaching to these concepts which reoccur across the curriculum. So presumably this means that they can continually connect back to prior knowledge. They're building on firm foundations with these facts connecting to bigger ideas. And I think where you've got a good curriculum where you can rely on things students already know and you know you can check and they've got it there those foundations and those ideas it really helps you to save time in the long run because you can bank on those connections being made reasonably quickly it's so interesting is it like it, it, it i love the way so this is what i love it's like a thread it's, so i'm i don't know you know heap giant pressure onto you because now i'm expecting this book to be an epic but it's <laughs> i i do think it's sort of it, it, it links to, you know, things like you know, functional things in the classroom, like routines for questioning and retrieval practice. But it also links to curriculum design. And to me, that's why it's such a powerful set of ideas, because. So so one of the things we talked about today in, in with the groups of specialist teachers talking about their books is the, the sequence over time and how, how maturation happens. And it is a kind of expert thing that in a curriculum design that you you don't over panic too much about you know you sow this you sow some seeds early on you sort of you get some stuff simmering knowing that it doesn't have to be fully come to fruition and then knowing that it's going to weave together later and i used to feel that about teaching say electricity as a science teacher like it's blooming hard to understand and you're not going to understand it straight away that's all right you know so but when you're a, a sort of newish teacher you sort of get freaked out by oh they don't understand it no they won't it's, it will take time and that that confidence coming through now one of the things i think what's your view of this because there's something i want to is like a practical implications definitely in primary secondary is kind of hands-on so sort of physical tactile concrete experience like say and i was going about this in my training like you know, if you talk to kids about the properties of water it looks kind of boring he says holding up a glass of water and it can be very sort of abstract, but when you start like tipping it up and 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 kind of manipulating water, and you, all the children are doing it with their own beaker, they're going, "Whoa, whoa! Look at my beaker! Well, look at my water! It's so cool!" And they're kind of interested, and they're looking at their actual water and seeing what it's doing, and that's something they're connecting with in real time with their own kind of model of water, and because you've made them all do it they're all getting that experience and to me that's not a sort of trivial like if you can be bothered to do it it feels like why if that's possible would you just show a load of powerpoints you know what i mean so do you think does that come into house the bell or am i kind of just amplifying <laughs> no it, it does actually um so the role of concrete experience that as talks about is um because he, he talks he talks about 
meaningful learning through co- these con- what he calls concepts and propositions but if we sort of stick with concepts for a bit like he he says that when you're very young so like in probably in the in the early years um you you don't have abstract knowledge of concepts to draw upon so if you talk to me now about water and I could I can imagine it can't I can imagine what you've just done if you didn't want to demonstrate it I could imagine it but a child of you know four five you know they could they could imagine it but what as your boss point is that they they would benefit far more from concrete experience of things because they don't have those abstract concepts in mind to draw upon he suggests that con- concrete experience becomes less important as you get older because you have more abstract concepts to draw upon but he does say that if you're teaching in domains that that students are unfamiliar with then you might need concrete experience again. And I think science is a good example of that because there are a lot of abstract ideas in science that a demonstration could like make far more con- concrete in a much kind of easier way. So he talks about it like that. And then I was just listening to William's um, uh, book uh, on, on Audible earlier. And, and, and you, know, you, you know, you both know this, but like when you're demonstrating things, the important thing is what you did just then, Tom, is like you held this glass of water up and you were getting us to look at it and focus our attention on the important thing. So it didn't become about my lesson. I had a glass of water in my lesson and I had a good old drink. And the point is that I drink lots of water and my teacher thinks that, you know, I'm drinking water and that's really good because that could be what a child, child takes away from that lesson. But the child won't if you draw their attention to the particular properties very carefully that you are trying to show them. And Willingham's point being that like too often the experience just becomes about, you know, they don't understand where to put their attention. So it just becomes about there was a glass of water or, you know, there was this thing or that thing in the classroom when actually we've got to direct their attention to exactly what we want, especially when we're using kind of concrete, concrete experiences. And it, it's so important in primary as well, because like you say, when they're beginning to develop those concepts, if you have just a PowerPoint or just something on the board, it's static and it's not dynamic and it's not interrogative. You can't do things with it to say, what would happen if I did that? What would happen if I moved this from here to there or added two more onto here? If you've got something concrete that's that you can move around, you can do the whole conceptual prototyping thing. You can start to say, well, you're beginning to think like that. But what if we did this? Does it still stay the same? You can't do that just with description and you can't do that necessarily just with something that's static on a board. So the use of concrete manipulatives in primary is so important when you and to make sure that they are dynamic and they are interrogative. So you can do conceptual prototyping, which you which other, which makes the connections that are so fundamental to later learning. So the move towards kind of PowerPoint teaching. Um, frankly drives me insane here ended my total <laughs> <laughs> I think that I think that was no I think that honestly that was incredibly well put so it's like you know for, for example you know not if you don't have this kind of idea of a sort of mental number line in your head like the way that mm-hmm. maybe adults do you have to be able to visual you, you can't visualize it so you have to be able to see it in a concrete way the way you describe mm-hmm. them and you have to have those concrete things. And I think that as you build, that's what Azibel is trying to say. He's trying to say, look, you know, if they're not, if they're not at the stage where they can mentally sort of visualize this stuff and they can draw upon concepts, then concrete is is necessary um, at that stage. But he also does say, and I think this is really like, I know I've just said this, but I think this is also really important. It doesn't just disappear after the early years and suddenly you've got all the concepts you need. If you're teaching a weird domain, like say I try to learn astrophysics or something and I don't really know very much about it I'm going to benefit from some concrete examples in that domain probably especially if I don't have much to draw upon um so yeah I think that's 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 um, at least the whole cognitive load thing as well because even in an expert domain like say architecture they still build a prototype to be able to show people what that would look like and be able to say what if I moved this part of the building over to there that this would be the effect because you can't imagine sometimes the, the difficult concepts even though you can understand them that you can't imagine it and hold it all there so the whole the use of manipulatives is 
fundamental to kind of reducing cognitive load in certain situations as well. But meaning does not travel up through the hand, through the arm and into the brain. So it's, it's about trying to get that internalised rather than the reliance on it for younger children, especially to use the manipulative as that bridge between the concrete and the abstract, not for it to become an over-reliant tool. What am I talking about tonight? Sorry. <laughs> no, no, honestly, I, I, I'm entertained. I mean, it's good, it's good. This is my this is my theme from. I know it's huge. I mean, I, I was with some primary teachers on Monday in um, in um, Barnsley, and one of the questions they asked me was about was, you know, one of the, cha- the challenges they said they had year one was was a, was about the, the like the oneness of one the count so counting, counting and bridging from counting to perceiving numbers to have a, a size, uh, which is linear and and. To me, that is a—it's like it's mind blowing when you when you don't teach that stuff, you you take it for granted. But in other words, that and this this is funny because I I tell this story to them because it's something that's in our family folklore. My aunt you, always used to say she never understood maths because when people said, "What's the difference between six and five? She'd say, "Well, there isn't a difference. They're just next to each other. There there's nothing between six and five because they're next." Uh. To each other. <laughs> so for her, this idea like, what are they saying? Like the answer is zero. And so she, for her, this idea that there's a whole one between five and six, which has got five and a half in it and stuff, it's just totally... And to me, it's like... I see. She's going from... She needs to move from number track to number line where there's an intermediate value. That's what she needs to do with your aunt. <laughs> but you just think, wow, oh, it's so amazing, isn't it? And there's something I want to ask you, Sarah, because I, I'm not sure you, you'll view this. And I, I have a bias towards this, and I don't know if I'm right, which is I think people... Not in maths, because because maths you can show your understanding by doing it, and by doing it repeatedly, and you get better at it in that way. But in lots of areas, I feel like children need more time to talk through their understanding to say, you know, why does it rain, or you know, what were the causes of World War Two, or and to to say it so that they can sort of get their heads, their thoughts around it. But is that is that evidence? Is that something which is known to be useful to kind of meant to literally talk through your understanding yeah definitely is um it's one of don losky's kind of um in his uh toolbox of strategies at paper 2013 paper i think it was where he talks about self-explanation i think this is a really important one he it seems to be well evidenced um that it that it supports so the idea of self-explanation is that essentially you are like rehearsing the connection between what's just the new material and your existing knowledge so kind of like a think pair share style type thing depending on the question that you use I totally agree with you Tom on this and I think it's it's like we've got lazy brains we listen to someone speak and we go yeah 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 I've got that I've got that and then, you know, if we're asked to do this think pair share or some sort of self-explanation task, we then realise we don't really get it because we can't explain it. And we or we explain it poorly or we get stuck, you know. So it's the fundamental stage of, of making the connection ourselves to what we already know and putting it crucially in our own words. Because mm. Azubel talks about this, how how like often um, verbatim responses are rewarded in class. Like, you know, what's, I've just told you the definition of osmosis. What's the definition of osmosis? And then someone parrots it back to you and you think, oh, they've got it. But they- That's so interesting. That's so insightful. Oh my God, you know, one one of the schools that we work with, with with our walkthroughs is one of the the techniques is say it again better. And, um, to get children to kind of elevate their answer from a sort of more basic one to and and one of the schools we were they they did a massive job on this and they say one of the things they had to talk about early on was that um tr- say it like this and the children were just like go da 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 say da 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 and they just literally echo it back and having to reframe the question to say well instead of using that word try using this word instead and the students at least had to form a sentence with that word and and construct something with it and and that's a development isn't it you have to think about that when you're teaching and wow I'm so interested to hear that's what Asabel said and they, they kind of like discovered that through their own practice yeah that, that, that is a, I can see the say it again better I, I think Asabel might say um I'm, I don't know what Asabel would say but I my my inkling is that he'd say like say it again in your own words or say it again differently 
Yeah, um, yeah. What, he, what he'd be interested in is like, how has it connected to your existing knowledge? You know, so this, this, there's always two parts to this, isn't there, with, with when we ask questions. There's, you know, questions can be for recall and learning in themselves. Like, and also it's so that we can work out what, what students know, right, assessment for learning. So if we get them to say it again differently or say it again in your words, we're actually, we've got this window into their schema. We've got this window into what did what they connected it to. And sometimes what they connected it to was just plain wrong. And <laughs> we're like, how did you make that connection? But at least we know. And but nine times out of ten, it will kind of hopefully it will be on the on the vaguely the right track. And it gives us this wonderful window. So I feel like it's a say it again in your words or say it again differently for Azubel, potentially. That Until they know it, in which case it could be a say it again better. That might ma- that matches with the whole speech gesture mismatch thing as well, where your understanding shows up in your hands before it shows up in your speech. And if you watch the children's, the whole gestural foreshadowing thing, it will turn up in your hands first. So if you watch them and you're watching their explanations and they can say, for example, they're multiplying by or divided by 10 and they're going, it's when you, and they know that the digits have got to move. They haven't yet got the vocabulary to explain how you're doing it. So that kind of links to that as well. If you're encouraging children to explain their thinking, you also get a wind, an extra window into how far along they are in terms of understanding it, in terms of what their hands are saying versus what their mouths are saying as well. Oh, that's really interesting. I've never thought of that. That is so yeah. interesting. Oh my God, we're getting we're getting the nod from from our producer that we we're, we're going to run out of time now. So we're going to have to come to a, to to an end soon, but. I have to share this because it popped into my head when you were talking about that, about the classic thing that, again, it's a family anecdote, this, but my, my son, right, when he went into his um, SATs exam, um, just before he went into to it, his, his friend told him, he said, um, I'll tell you a really good phrase to use is the heir of a Ross, of a Ross child, meaning like someone who's really rich, you know, the heir of a Ross child, H-E-I-R. <laughs> And my son heard, and said, my son thought this was really cool. He told us afterwards, we said, well, what sort of other things do you want? He said, yeah, well, James told me all about this air of a Rothschild thing. So I put it in and we went, really? What, just like that? And, and we said, well, what did you write? And he wrote, well, it's like, and he, he'd written it, A-I-R, air of Rothschild, like W-R-A-T. <laughs> so he turned this the phrase into the air of Rothschild. <laughs> and going, what a... Why did you listen to James just before you went into your stuff? <laughs> it was like just being shared. But you know, James had a really good idea there, but it just didn't quite make sense to my son, who was in his schema. He just was he had Roth was something he'd heard of and he knew what that was. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that, was that was great. A, cho- a choice moment. But anyway, look. It's great. I'm, I'm gonna, we're going to wrap it up. It's just mass, massive thank you to Sarah. I'm so excited about um, when when your book if comes to the, an end and you've f- found the time to finish writing it. A lot of people are going to love reading it. Meanwhile, overpracticed.wordpress.com. It's one of the best blogs there is because it's like a proper... Uh, there, there's, there's references and everything. I mean, like, <laughs> puts my, puts my off-the-cuff nonsense to shame. It really does. It's absolutely... <laughs> Really, just powerful, powerful stuff. So thank you so much for everything you've been doing. Emma and I are huge fans. We've been geeking out about you for, for months, and we've just <laughs> it's great to talk to you. So thank, thank you, Emma. Sarah. Thank you, Emma, and thank you, Sarah. Thank you both. It's been amazing. It's lovely to find people who are happy to talk about this stuff at <laughs> 7 o'clock on a, on a Thursday evening. So, yeah, same time next week, hopefully. There's nothing better to do, surely. Well, so look, thanks, everyone. Thanks for, listen, for listening to uh, Mind the Gap. And I hope you enjoy our, our recent run of episodes. We've had some absolutely awesome guests, lots more to come as well. Um, keep listening on the YouTube channel or on, on the podcast platform of your choice. And we'll see you very soon. Thank you.